Hello everybody, welcome back to this third video in this uh, video series on the effect of uh, COVID-19 on the training industry. Uh, today we're going to be talking about some really practical steps on how you can move um, and or convert your classroom-based training to the online format. I'm also happy to welcome back Espen Andersen. Welcome, Espen. Hello. Those of you who don't know Espen, uh, let me just really briefly introduce Espen. Uh, Espen's an uh, associate professor of strategy at the BEI Norwegian Business School. He is leading the Center of Di Digitalization and is also an adjunct professor at the um, Department of Computer Science at the University of Oslo. Um, Espen holds a doctorate from the from a doctor of business administration from the Harvard Business School and has also researched, consulted and spoken on technology and strategy issues uh, around the world for large organizations. Uh, and uh, he's also currently serving on two board of technology companies. And I think Espen, I would probably also add that uh, in in your capacity as a professor and the work you've done, and also in the capacity of having converted your own training to an online format, I would say you're an authority in, in what we're going to be talking about today. Thank you. Yes. Um, Espen, you know, we have over the past few weeks, like we've said before, discussed the training industry's re response to the COVID-19. And we've seen reactions across the whole spectrum from really swift action and taking advantage on, of, of the shift we see to also, you know, training providers just seeing a dark forest ahead and don't really know how to adapt. Um, I think the million dollar question many training providers ask themselves is how do we make the shift? to a digital training delivery platform. What are the natural steps uh, to convert an analog to a digital training business model? And what do we need to have in place to succeed over the long haul? Um, you know, when we started this discussion, discussion, you mentioned three different phases you have to go through to succeed with this. Why don't you take us through these stages? Right. Um, I base this on sort of a general model of how technologies evolve, specifically technologies that have a wide range of uses, so digital technologies normally. And uh, when a technology is new, we see this um, substitution so that, you know, the technology is a substitute for what's already there. So if you think about cars, for instance, the first cars looked like horse carts with an engine on them. So you're basically taking what you're doing and you're making it digital. Some people call that digitizing. Um, you have to make uh, the books or the training material available in a digital format. You have to switch your classes uh, from lecturing to a room to lecturing to a camera. And you have to keep track of students online. And in this phase, you, you're basically taking what you're already doing and making it digital. And, and this is a really important phase because it is sort of the basis for everything else. Now, one of the things you'll find, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences in this, but is that, you know, what works in a physical space doesn't always work in a digital space. So very quickly, you'll have to transform to the next step, which is basically changing what you do, changing the delivery model to a digital format. And that might mean many things. For instance, um, in my executive classes, um, we have students come in to the business school and they're there for three or four days all together in classrooms, having a very intensive session. And the reason we do that is because people are at work they need to travel to get there, so it, it, it makes sense to do it over four days. Well, it's pretty obvious that sitting for four days and staring into a computer screen is really tiring, both for the teachers and for the students. So, and, you know, we don't have the travel 
need for travel anymore. So quite quickly we think, okay, we'll have to change our delivery into smaller portions, maybe over several days um, and so on. Um, it's pretty clear that having somebody stand and speak for two hours doesn't work. You'll have to make shorter snippets of information and make that available. And it is also, you know, when I'm standing in a classroom, I can see how the students react. I can adapt what I say to their body language. I can see somebody maybe is a little bit quiet, so I'll pull them into the discussion, things like that. That's really hard to do in an online format. So, you know, you need to start to think, okay, I'm no longer just doing what I normally do digital. I have to change what I do to digital. And the third phase is when you're sort of in the new normal, when everything you do is conditioned on digital and, and that's how you do things, that's how you think, that's how you price. Your whole business model, the whole organization has changed. And uh, that has to change. Um, well, for instance, uh, it's very common at a business school, certainly the one I work at, that you track how much people do, whether they do their teaching based on how many hours they are in the classroom. Well, that's not a meaningful measure if you are uh, doing things over video because you'll make a video, maybe half an hour long video. It will take you a day and a half to make it. But then, of course, once you made it, it can be played over and over and over. So, and you know, so how are you going to keep track of that 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 faculty member, that teacher? Uh, you know, are you going to pay them by how much they are standing in front of students saying the same things over and over again? That is not going to be a meaningful way to do that. Right. So, you know, you first you do whatever you did before digital. Then you change what you do because you have this new thing. And then you transition the whole organization over to being mainly digital and where the physical part is an additional activity or maybe doesn't exist at all. Right. So to summarize, you're, you're talking about three steps here. So the first one is basically get online. Yeah. Just get online. The second is basically make sure you make the training fit the new online format mm -hmm. and the third is you know reinvent your business model to fit in long term the new normal absolutely yeah can we talk a little bit about the first step you know what's the practicalities you have to think of in the first step here well, the practicalities, and I'm sure lots of people are in that right now, um, is, you know, well, for me, it wasn't so difficult. I did my first online lecture in 1994, uh, and I've been doing online video teaching for as a side activity, not as the main activity, for a long time. So for me and uh, the people I work with at the university, at, at BI, um, it was mainly taking a side activity and making it the main activity. We already had the technology and sort of the experience to set it up. But for a lot of my colleagues, it was, you know, first time going on video conferencing. What do you do? We had people standing in classrooms with a camera and the camera crew filming them as they were talking to an empty classroom. So it's basically do what you already do, you know, get the technology, get everything up and running, tell the students, get them to show up and try to figure out all this stuff that you need to learn. How does Zoom work, which is a tool we're using right now, or whatever tool you choose to use? How about lighting, sound quality? Sound is much more important than, uh, than light. Uh, how do you change your, you know, how do you conduct a discussion, getting people in? Do you make recordings available or not? You know, all these things you have to start thinking about very, very quickly. So first thing then is basically decide what technology you want to use and learn how it works, basically. Absolutely. First, first and foremost, you know, learn the tool. Um, and, and I have to say for people who do provide training, you can outsource this to people who are technologists, but there is no escaping learning it yourself. You know, you have to understand how to set it up. In a situation like the COVID-19, you, you may have to set it up yourself because you are isolated. 
um, but you can't, you can never trust or, you know, sort of see the quality obligation to the technologists. They can help you, but you have to take responsibility for the overall quality. Right. So, so then that's, that's the first step, the te te technology side. Then basically you need to go out there and tell your target audience that now you can offer it online. Yeah. So it's a marketing thing to make sure you can actually fill your virtual classrooms. Absolutely. Yeah. And depending on, depending on where you are in the world, that might be a tall order. Um, I mean, we live in Norway, fantastic internet connectivity everywhere. People in general have access to technology and they're generally willing to use it. That may be much more difficult uh, in certain parts of the world. Certainly if you go global, you have to think about that. What, what skill set would you say you need to make it through the first 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 step here? Um, well, like I always, I, I, I coach teachers. And um, so what I always tell them is that, you know, you need two things. You need to know your content. And you have to know about what you're teaching, right? <laughs> if you don't know, know the stuff you're teaching, I can't help you. Um, and, uh, and the second one is you need to care about the people at the other end. Uh, and if you care about the people at the other end, that they actually receive what you're saying, then it doesn't matter so much how you do it, because if you really, you really do that, then, then it comes through. The rest is training and skills, you know, fairly simple skills. Like, you know, like what I'm doing now is look into the camera. Don't look down at you, you know, or the student, because then you look disinterested because you're looking somewhere else. Look into the camera. Right. Speak with a clear voice. Don't speak slowly. Speak fast. Because if you're providing a, a recording, the students can pause it. If you're speaking too slow, the students will just speed it up, right? <laughs> Um, so, so they can do that because they can watch it faster. So, you know, you have to sort of get to learn all these little details around how teaching is digital is different. But I say the same skills in terms of communication and knowledge about the subject, those are the important things. If you're a good teacher in the classroom, I think you'll be a good teacher um, online. Okay, so excellent. Then let's talk about step two, you know, convert the training, you know, the, the instructor-led training material to fit, you know, the online format. What do you need to consider when you're doing this? Well, a, 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 typ a typical classroom session um, is some presentation, uh, you know, where the, you're, you're talking about something, maybe showing PowerPoints or a Blackboard or something like that. Then you have some discussion, question from the students, uh, and, and maybe you have a test. Well, I, at least for me, I find that in a digital format, it's much harder to do those three things in the same session. So, you know, what I have found is that it's much better to record the presentation and do that well. You know, use the tools. For instance, if you are going to talk about a company, I, I talk about business. You know, now that I have to make a video anyway, why not go to that company and talk to them, <laughs> you know, and do that instead, right? So you make a little TV program and spend some time making sure it's good. Then you have the students show that. Then you go into a live video conference where there are no slides. And what you do is interaction. You ask the students questions, you put them into subgroups that discuss and so on and so forth. And you use that session for getting interaction and getting the questions out. So I find that the students are much better if they know that that's the purpose uh, of this call, that we're going to go on there and we're going to talk to each other. Then they watch the video beforehand, then they discuss it. That's a much better experience. If you try to do it all in one session, that doesn't work well, in my experience. How, how important is it to start with your learning objectives, your, lear your objectives for learning outcomes when you start converting the, the classroom-based format to the online format? Well, that is, that's important in all teaching. Uh, it's especially important um, when, um, you know, 
students are taking online classes less for the ambience and the experience. If I'm, I, I tend to think in universities, we're primarily talking about course and training providers here, but very often training has an aspect of actually being there, you know, the, the ambience of the place. And uh, um, if, you, if you don't have that, and you have that to a limited degree, you have to be much more specific about what the students will get out of it. Uh, you also tend to see that courses that are provided online will be shorter and more specific. So rather than having a six day course, maybe we'll have six courses that each take about one day and the students will take this one and that one and perhaps not this one. So it's much more mixing and matching. So you need to be really specific. The second issue about learning objectives is that you need to be really focused on them because you are suddenly, like we talked about, you're going to be competing against the whole world. So you need to be very specific in your understanding of what the students want and then show that you can deliver to that specific thing they need um, to, to a much higher degree than in a traditional geographically bounded physical uh, learning environment. Right. I, I hear a couple of things here. Let, let me try to sum up a little bit of what you're, you're saying here. So when you convert this, this classroom-based format to online format, number one, you have to really understand your learning objectives and you have to begin you know, with the learning objectives. Then basically you talked a lot about also how you break it up into digestible parts. Yep. And, and then the, the third I hear is you talked about the different types of activities that you need to then, when you have the, the digest, digestible parts, you need to, to fit it with, 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 with optimal activities like chat or polling or whiteboarding or, or breakout groups and all this, this, the, 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 the different tools you have. And then I, I hear you talking about engagement, yep. engaging the students. If you are competing with everybody in the whole world, the one thing that you can have um, that is very hard to copy is the local engagement. If you can get the students to talk to each other and help to each other and, and, and have a shared experience, then you have something that's very hard to replicate on YouTube. Um, so, um, so that's important. This thing about cutting things up into smaller pieces is of course, if you, if you make a small piece of content you can use it in this specific course you thought about, but you can also use it in other settings. So gradually you build up a library of pieces of content that you can mix and match in what you are providing. All right, that, I think that's great. Let, let's talk about step three. You know, when, when things are, the dust are settling, you're looking for the more long-term, uh, you know, the long-term view when when you adapt to the new normal situation you talked about you need to realize you now have a new reality and you need to change and also uh, adapt your business model to the online uh, format how what do you can what, what would you consider in that stage what's important here well, I'd, first I'd say that managerially, this is perhaps the hardest challenge because, you know, we still don't know if this situation with the virus will continue for a long time. Uh, we are now in April. Will things be okay again by August when the fall semester starts up? Maybe it will last until New Year's. Maybe it will last until next summer. The longer this thing goes on, the more the digital shift will mean. So, you know, when you're making that decision, am I going to convert my whole business model, my whole organization digital, that, that's a very difficult decision to make. And, you know, it, it might be easy for me to sit there and be sort of strategic and say that, but, you know, it, it, I, I fully respect that that's not an easy decision to make. Um, what probably is going to happen is that you need to consider your staffing uh, because um, in, the quality requirement of the instructors will go up. Um, you need to be a much better teacher in order to compete. The flip side is if you have a really good teacher, you can use him or her in many more settings, um, much more effectively. So um, we'll probably see fewer but better teachers. Um, 
we might see an expansion of the market in finer and finer specializations. So you need to sort of reconsider, am I going to offer everything I do now or should I focus on things that I seem to have some distinctive advantage? And, and of course, you need to consider pricing, your costs. Are you going to continue to have, if you have your own facilities, are you going to continue to have them? Or are you going to scale down on that and scale up on technology and uh, bandwidth and storage and things like that? I was just having a really interesting uh, conversation. Uh, one of our salespersons says, uh, you know, they just talked with a, with, with a training provider in the UK who basically said um, they're, no, they're now going to, evaluate whether they're going to actually continue working remotely with their staff, which is yeah. one distinct, you know, adaptation to, to running an online, uh, you know, business model. Well, you, you work for a company that's centralized in one space, but work all over the, I mean, that's your company, right? So, and they said, do we really need to be on site? Well, we need to travel a bit, but if people get more accepting of video conferencing as a technology, perhaps you don't need to travel that much. What about, cause, cause now you talk about staffing and, and capability building really, really important, not only in the, you know, in, in, you know, for the instructor, but also capabilities in, in, in the tech side of, of running online and also, also capabilities in terms of marketing and, and sales when you run this business online rather than classroom based. What's your, what's your perspective on that? Well, that's also a difficult decision because what we've been seeing so far with training providers, I presume, in universities the same, is that you're taking your current student population and moving them online. And uh, at least conceptually, that's quite easy because you know them, right? <laughs> um, and, and also, I have to say, at least from my perspective, the students are very forgiving for mistakes you make in this process because everybody realizes that you're trying to do the best you can and you're trying to make the best of a bad situation and so on. That patience is not going to be there very long. So, so um, you need to consider that. Innovation is, of course, always important when you run when you run a business. But would you would you um, say that in in an online setting, it it becomes even more important, you know, for the business model that you really have you you, you get to spend enough time developing the business, and not just running it because of the the competitive side of of running an online business. Well. There's always this dichotomy between operations and innovation. Am I going to run the business the way it is efficiently or am I going to spend uh, money on innovation? When you're in very uncertain terms like you are now, you need to adopt a model of continuous experimentation. So, for instance, uh, I mean, if you're a training provider and you're relatively small, this comes easy because you, you launch things. If they don't fly, well, they didn't fly, right? At a big university like I work at, uh, there tends to be long committee meetings and sort of, are we going to launch a new program or not? That model is just not going to work in a very fluid environment. You need to say, okay, let's launch this and see what happens. You know, let's make experiments. Let's launch seven new programs next year. Oh, okay, only two of them were successful. That's fine. We learned something. So you need to have this and if you look at the great technology companies of the world, like Amazon or uh, Google or Facebook or, you know, most people that are online and, and have a digital interface, they continuously experiment, 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 and then they systematically learn from what's going on and they keep what works. And is it fair to say that when you run the, uh, you know, virtual classroom format or even the e-learning, is it? Is it, um, is it easier to, to, to do the experimentation rather than if you run a classroom-based format where you have to rent, you know, uh, you know, you have to rent a venue and you have to set up a different type of business model? It's easier because launching something new is quite cheap. The infrastructure is already there. It might not be cheap in terms of marketing, uh, but certainly in terms of the operation itself is quite cheap. And there is, there's another advantage, which is, um, you know, right now when we're talking 
in this meeting right now, we're recording it. So we can go back and look at it afterwards and see what worked, what didn't work. And you can do the same thing with teaching. One of my big beefs with instruction in a university setting is that teachers should sit in on each other's classes to make each other better. And that doesn't happen that much. In a digital format, it's easy to do so. That's a really good tip to, to our viewers, you know, to actually do that. To, to allow for, for improvement of, of how we run things. Don't, don't run it as silos. Make sure there's cross-pollination between teachers and, and classes. Absolutely. And, and there are a couple of other things as well. Um, I, I, from the universities I work with, I've seen that, you know, don't make centralized decisions about how to do things. Don't make a decision saying you have to do it this way. Because... Each situation is different and each teacher is different. Much better to trust the people who do the instruction because most people want to do a good job and most people are quite fast learners if they have to. So, you know, you have to trust uh, the people who are at the front line and support them as much as possible. That, that's, that's really important. Let's talk about one thing you mentioned also, uh, which is, a is, is important for the business model, pricing. I think a lot of our uh, of training providers wonder, what does it mean to my pricing strategy when I run online format versus classroom-based uh, training? Yeah, that is a big challenge. It's a classical disruption. And a disruption is when a new way of doing things comes in. Uh, it has lower pricing and lower quality. Um, but it appeals to a part of the market that you normally don't care about. And you video, video and online delivery certainly has been a disruption, but it has never sort of really taken off. Now it might be a situation where it really takes a much bigger part of the market. And, uh, you know, that's pricing wise is very, very hard because it's, it's no doubt in my mind that in a digital channel, the price will go down. Um, and uh, at the same time, if you're a classical course provider with big investments in facilities and so on and so forth, those costs don't go away, you know. So a pure play, somebody who comes on only in the digital market might be a very formidable competitor, even though you never heard of them before, because they have costs that are aligned with the new model. And... Uh, there are ways of, of getting there, but they involve very difficult managerial decisions. And generally, I think we will see a pressure on prices and we will see new ways of pricing according to lifetime value of the student, how many courses the students take, add-on services such as consulting and, and, uh, and tailoring of offerings to particular, particular customer groups and so on and so forth. We'll see... Great variation, but a really tough price pressure. Right, and I think also probably what, you, what what's going to happen when we when 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 the online format really starts to to get more penetration in the market, you, you know, usually classroom based training is priced by delegates per delegates, yeah. but you'll probably see, probably see more subscription based models as well. Absolutely. The Spotify model for uh, for uh, music, you know, you you absolutely see that for uh, uh, online teaching. In fact, you do it already. All right. Um, what are I mean, if we if we can talk about common mistakes to avoid when when converting your online your your classroom based training to online training, what what are a couple of things you'd like to 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 em emphasize then? I think there is, if there's one big mistake to avoid is to think that your current decision models and remuneration models and administration models will work the same way in an online format. I'm not so concerned about, the, you know, all those stupid mistakes like a bad quality picture or, you know, all these things because very quickly we'll learn how to deal with that. It's the organizational and managerial challenges that really are big out there. Um, and, you know, the, the need to think in a new way, particularly when you're in a crisis, there's always a temptation to centralize decisions and to sort of, you know, make, to, to, to take control. And in a, in a 
in a fluid situation, which we don't see the end of, um, there, the right way to deal with it is to loosen up, trust whoever is doing something, listen to innovators and rapidly implement what seems to work. So that's the biggest mistake you do is to try to control everything uh, and, and set very strict rules about how things are going to be done. What, what specifically are common mistakes that you would see in terms of converting the, the, the training material from instructor-led to online? Um. Well, it's, it's, it's keeping the same frameworks, um, doing it precisely the same way. Um, for instance, um, if you're converting a classroom discussion to an online discussion in a discussion forum where people write in comments, um, uh, you have to manage it in a different way. If you try to say, you know, does anybody have any comments? You will not get a comment because people don't know how to deal with it. You need to seed it with questions. You need to manage it in a different way. Um, maintaining control can be, but can be hard. You, you, you very often see people who take a, a course and then convert it into something online, almost work themselves to death because they think they need to respond to everything right away um, and work 24 hours. And that's, you, know, you need to train the students not to expect that. Um, it comes very easy in the physical setting. It's, it's not so hard because expectations, so you need to set expectations around the progress of the course uh, and what the students um, part of it is. So when you talk about progress, uh, does that also is that related also to the organization and the breaking down of of the the instructor led material in, in in smaller chunks? Well, um, for you, you get a very interesting discussion about intellectual property rights. Um, if if I record a video for a specific course, does it belong to me? Does it belong to the school? You know. Am I free to take that video and use it in another setting? Um, and uh, for universities, that's largely taken care of in the sense that it is the property of the individual faculty. If you're a training provider, you very definitely need to have that part in place. So talking to a lawyer uh, might be something to think about and, uh, and also consider remuneration, perhaps different models if you buy a video from an instructor versus you using a video from an instructor. Common mistakes around time when you run an online or a virtual classroom or online training. Going on too long, and um, perhaps we're guilty of that, we too. Um, you know, you go on and on and on because in, an online, in a physical classroom, you get energy from the interaction that's there. You know, you talk to all the students, you're used to sort of managing your attention. Um, you look forward to, you know, after an hour or 45 minutes, a little coffee break where you can talk to people. It's very, very easy to go on and on in a video conferencing setting. And it's very easy not to provide breaks, to forget about breaks, you know, and, and, and have people actually take them. What about the number of participants? Because it's so appealing with, the, with virtual classrooms because basically there's no capacity restraints. But, you know, is, it, is, is there... You know, because did also this also lead to the fact that you take too many on, even though you haven't changed the format properly to fit the number of participants? Uh, well, that's a question with a very nuanced answer. You know, I can easily see classes or, or courses with millions of students. I mean, that and, and the experience can be great. You know, it depends on the topic. I can also see almost Oxford style tutoring situations where you're two or three students doing something. So if you can finance that, you know, that might be wonderful. I'm, I'm not sure there is a right answer uh, in there. And there needs to be a match between the requirement for interaction and the number of people. If you're only delivering sort of online, here is how you do something, please go ahead. You know, if you have 20 million students, fine. Let's round off the discussion by talking a little bit about key success factors. And maybe we could break it down a little bit in terms of, you know, what are, 
What are key success factors around the design and format? What are key success factors in the execution phase? Uh, and, and maybe key success factors around technology? Um, what, what's, what's your perspective on this? In general, again, you know, there are lots of, there's lots of variation here. And to a certain extent, we'll learn a lot because people will take things online that haven't been online before. Um, but I think we'll see a transition to shorter units of learning that can be reused in many settings. And there, normally when you have a componentized technology, there will be, be a bit business of providing the small components, but there will also be a business in putting them together intelligently and a sort of distinction between the people who do one thing and people who do the other to a much larger extent. A transition to subscription-based will also mean that, you know, you, you need to provide training that builds on top of each other. I work for a big business school in Norway. Um, one of our main com com competitive advantages is that we provide courses that are on topic, but they build up to degrees and you can put it together yourself. So something like that, I assume, will have to happen in the digital world to a larger extent. What about the execution phase? When, at the, action, the action delivery of the training. What are some key think, success factors? Well, you need to be very clear in, in your communication to the students, be really structured in how you use an online learning environment. I'm not talking about the lectures or the instruction itself, but the whole package around it. I don't think it's very important which tool you choose. I think it's very important that you use whatever tool you have to the fullest capacity and you make use of whatever is in there. And in my experience, that very often means putting together packages of tools rather than going with one specific. Um, so you need to sort of understand what the tools are and put them together. And that's very, very important. Being clear and structured and uh, communicative. Also, you need to be very efficient in what you do. When I first started to teach large college classes, I scrapped having office time. Instead, I said, I want questions from the students via email. Email was very new um, at this point. And I took each question I got and I answered it. And then I posted it on a web page. So I, gradually I built up a collection of questions. And I actually got an award for being the most available professor in the whole university, even though I didn't have office time. And it wasn't a lot of work for me because I told the students that I don't want to answer questions that have already been answered. So you need to think very carefully about being efficient in how you do something at the same time as you're seen as being very responsive to the students. You basically economize your time there by, by you know, carefully selecting pre-class activities, what's going to be in-class activities and maybe even post-class activities. Yeah, I wrote a book for the Harvard Business School together with uh, Professor Bill Schiano at Bentley University. And uh, the framework we used was foundations, flow, and feedback. So when you design a course, you need to think about the foundations, which are the contract you have with the students, the flow, which is the execution, and then how you provide feedback, which is what all students want. And you need to think about it both in terms of the experience from the students, but also so that you don't work yourself to death. What about engagement? We talked about engagement. Is, is regular engagement, a, a, would you say that's a key success factor for, for actually reaching the learning outcomes? I, it certainly is for reaching the learning outcomes. It also is, I think, a very important competitive um, factor and will be more so. If you can get students to engage in your classes, then, you know, they will recruit new students. At least that's what I've seen happen to the courses that I've been successful with, that they become self-recruiting over time because the students like the process they go through. So that's become, that becomes very important. And it's a hard nut to crack in an online environment. One of the positive things is that you often see students that are not very engaged in the classroom can be very engaged if you do, you know, if you have online discussions where people type in their comments. Just to, to round it all up, you know, um, what's your best tip to people who are now going to deliver online training for the first time? Hmm. 
Uh, I summed it up in a little video I did, or a couple of small videos I did on this, but there are things like... I, there, there are lots of things to say. Look into the camera. Sound is more important than picture. Um, you know, where... Don't, don't have other things take the attention. All these things you need to think about. Um, but those are just small things. Uh, the main thing is know your stuff, what you're teaching and care about the people on the other side. And, and then think about what's the contract you have with the students when you start, how you're going to deliver and how you're going to provide something back. And if you think in those terms, and there is really isn't that much difference between on-premise and, and digital delivery. I guess, you know, basically you're saying just have confidence in your own you know, knowledge of, of, of what you're teaching and go for it. Absolutely. And you know what? You're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up. Uh, we all do. Uh, we certainly have done in these conversations. <laughs> so... And that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You know, the only, I, I guess the, um, uh, the only shame in, in failing is not to learn from it, I guess. Well, if you don't fail, you haven't tried hard enough, you know. So, um, yeah, experiment. And I, I think the students out there, as long as it's, you're sincere and you really want them to learn, they are very forgiving of all kinds of little mistakes you make. I think that's a really good end note on, on this discussion. I thank you so much, Espen, for your insights. Your very, very insightful comments on how to convert to an online format. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Bye. Been fun. Bye, Espen.